Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Folks, today is a new day in animal healthcare, and MedGene is shining bright. MedGene has been a key innovator in the field of platform vaccine technology. MedGene enables veterinarians to put platform vaccines to work for the animals in their care. Swine, cattle, and companion animals all stand to benefit. It's time to talk to MedGene. It's a new day in animal health care. You can learn more about MedGene, the company, as well as what platform vaccine technology is by going to medgenelabs.com or even better yet, follow MedGene on LinkedIn. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here and I'm excited. This is a fun and quick episode with Kennedy Youngren. And we, she, Kennedy is going to be providing some really practical tips to help you, or I guess all of us as ranchers and farmers who are busy and active and always on the go, feel like we have more energy, um, uh, reduced joint pain, not rely on that bottle of Advil so much, not rely on that caffeine and just live better lifestyles. And like I said, these are really practical tips and easy changes. And I'm really excited to have Kennedy on the show and bring that conversation to you. And it's also really fun because as beef producers, we're always talking about how beef is so healthy for others to consume, but we're also going to talk about how it's so important for us to continue eating beef and um, fueling our bodies as well. So it's a quick, short episode, but like I said, with really practical tips to help all of us live healthier lives and just feel better in general. So with that, let's visit with Kennedy. All right, Kennedy. Well, it is fun to visit with you on Zoom again. I think feel like lately it's just been random texts or Instagram messages back and <laughs> forth, but you are one busy gal when it comes to helping people fuel their bodies and kind of live their best lives on that front. Plus being involved, I know your husband's on the dairy and you've got a little girl too. So I appreciate you taking time out of your day to visit with me and share information with my audience about um, the nutritional requirement of ranchers, because ranchers are very concerned about meeting the nutrition requirements for their cattle and all their other livestock. Mm-hmm. But we're going to talk about the importance of taking care of ourselves today during National Nutrition Month. So thank you. Heck yeah, Heck yeah of course. Thanks for having me and no perfect time. That's for sure. Okay. So obviously I've had the privilege to work with you and get to know you, but for those listeners out there right now, can you share a little bit about what you do today and Mm kind of why you're passionate about helping those people in rural America? Heck yeah. I love this question. So I'll give you like my little elevator pitch. So I say I'm Kennedy Younger and I am a registered dietitian married to a fourth generation dairyman. I live in the heart of central Minnesota on my husband's fourth generation dairy farm. And we're raising up cattle and a little cowgirl. And she is just, she's super awesome right now, but she's my why at this moment. She's not my wife for why I launched my business and why I'm so passionate about what I do. So truly again, Dylan, my husband, he's always my example that I like to give. He was the fourth child of four. He is the youngest Um, his mom was a hairstylist. His dad was a busy dairy farmer. Obviously they farm together now and Dylan was fed out of the Schwann's man's truck. So he has a highly processed taste palette for things like chicken nuggets, chicken patties, hamburger helper, mac and cheese, all real foods, but Dylan doesn't like vegetables. So, you know, inspired by his poor nutrition habits, I, the more I was involved in agriculture and the more of his friends that I met, the more people that I met from across the country, the more I saw that this was a theme, you know, in rural America, we're traveling hours to a gas station or a grocery store. Um, We have poor health care for so many of us across, across the country. And we have to do some really hard advocating. So if I get to be one person on your care team that increases your nutrition knowledge and stands behind you when you're doing more you know, advocating for yourself in a hospital standpoint or in a hospital atmosphere, then that's exactly what I want to do and what I want to be. So I'm here to change the way that America's farmers, ranchers, and cowboys feel themselves. And it's been the most inspiring thing. I think a lot of times, you know, I work with people and we talk about changing lives, but I think the people that I work with forget that they change mine too. So it's pretty been, it's been pretty fun. And you do not come from an ag background, correct? You married into it? I do not. Nope. So my dad was, my dad owns an electric business. My mom has some desk job and 
my dad grew up on a dairy farm and since it's been turned organic and then sold the cows. But growing up, my parents were always like, well, if you don't, if you don't uh, start behaving, you're going to have to go throw hay at Uncle Adam's farm. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. That's not for me. And then I married a dairy farmer. So, you know, funny how that works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tables turn sometimes. Oh, yes. Yes. He's got a bigger plan for us. That is for sure. Okay, Kennedy, you are a huge advocate for shifting the narrative around the cows come first when it comes to nutrition. Mm -hmm. Why are you such an advocate about that? Heck yeah, I love it. So full transparency, you guys, I brought some notes. So as a dietitian, I'm very evidence-based. I like to make sure that what I preach and what I share with people is backed up by science, because if I can't do that, then again, how do I know it's true? So um, we've got plenty of research to support that men and women are underfueled. And when they're underfueled, we see incidents of injury start to increase. So my background, my master's degree is exercise science and sports nutrition. I fueled Olympic level athletes all the way down to high school level athletes. And across the board, I fuel farmers, ranchers, and cowboys like athletes. But when we start doing studies that are specific to farmers and ranchers, we see that 28% of farmers injuries are coming specifically from tractor related injuries and accidents. So here's the thing. I talk a lot about nutrition and I talk a lot about hydration. And when we're under fueled and we're not optimally hydrated, we have a starved brain. And then we also see some performance deficits. So the first thing that go are speed, strength, and stamina. And then from there, it's decision-making skills, balance, hand-eye, coordination, and the list goes on and on. So if you think about that, if 28% of our injuries that are on farm, on ranch are coming from tractors, we could have made a split decision and had to pivot on the road. A car could have been in our lane. We could have had to choose between hitting the mailbox or, you know, being over the, the double yellow if you guys are people who drive down tar. So... I mean, if that and that alone isn't something to be a testament to, I've got a couple other research studies and what we see and a big part of what I do is fostering bone and joint health because so many men and women are reporting pain, just like this research study says. So it says 87.6% of men and women in agriculture report joint pain, about 50% have diagnosed arthritis and about 25, 25% have diagnosed osteoarthritis. Now, the culprit of 50% of that statistic is pro-inflammatory diets. So pro-inflammatory diets doesn't necessarily just look like, you know, those processed seed oils that everybody wants to rage about right now. It looks like going too long without eating. It looks like eating insufficiently or using alcohol and caffeine in placement of actual meals or not working through some of the emotions and covering those up with alcohol and caffeine. So it's a big part of what I do, yes, fueling farmers and ranchers, but also working through their relationship with, with food, because we've been taught for so long that we're going to wake up and the cows got to eat before we do. And then we'll come in at noon and we'll get a lunch. Then we're going to go, you know, balls to the wall until we get in at seven 38, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And we'll have two big meals and that's it. The average farmer or rancher is more substantially more expending. Okay, how do, how do I say this? The farmer or rancher is expending substantial amounts more energy than the average human. So sometimes we forget that even though we're bouncing in an air ride cab, yes, we're sitting, we're still working through calories when we're doing that. So if you're a dairy producer, like my husband, you're still milking cows twice a day, and then you're getting in the field for planting and harvest. So now his expenditure is increased. Whereas ranchers, let's say we're not necessarily, you know, milking cows twice a day, but we're still having some level of increased energy expenditure that we have to account for. So I know we got other questions and we'll talk about fueling ourselves and tractors, but there's my big rage. And, you know, the, the incredible improvements that I get to hear about on my end as the dietitian, when people start optimally fueling themselves, it's like, my sleep is improved. I don't have to have caffeine. I'm losing weight. My blood pressure is better. Weight loss is finally something that feels achievable. My cortisol is not so high. I mean, all of these markers of success when it comes to health are improving in the correct, correct direction. And it's the coolest thing to be on the back end of. Well, I appreciate how you said, you know, it impacts everything. I mean, you talked about our decision-making, which we're constantly doing. I mean, how many farmers and ranchers are facing, feel like they have decision fatigue, but by the amount of decisions that they're making every single day. And additionally, like you talked about joint health and how nutrition plays a role into that, because I know I'm guilty of having a bottle of Advil stashed in about every vehicle and my purse and wherever. And then that comes because I know a lot of other people who have to do that too. So, mm -hmm. but if we can feed ourselves and that's not necessary anymore, how great would that be? <laughs> I 
Exactly. Exactly. I love it. So it's fun outcomes we see when people start working with good nutrition for sure. So with that, I know one of the misconceptions that can kind of come when we start making changes with our lifestyle is that it's going to be more work and it's going to take more time and we don't have time. How can changing your nutrition habits not feel like a burden and be easy for for busy ranchers? I love this. So in our line of work, we're very much type A perfectionist OCD. So many of us, I shouldn't, I shouldn't broadband everybody, but it is a big part of who I see. And when we leave a session or when they walk away from a session with me, or they listen to a podcast like this, you know, we give a pretty substantial amount of information. So it's information overload. And then we have black or white, all or nothing thinking. So they think, well, I'm getting off that zoom and I'm going to eat breakfast within 30 to 40 minutes. And I'm going to drink half my body weight ounces of water and this and that, and this and that. And that's not sustainable because if you're throwing six, seven, eight new performance fueling strategies at yourself, you're bound to burn out in a week. So what I usually tell people is solidify one good habit each week. And then we're going to have it stack. So what's going to happen is first week, we're going to focus on your hydration. We're going to gradually work you up until we reach that half your body weight in ounces of water by five to 10 ounces more each day. Your urine is your tool as it starts to run clear. It looks like water or as you're drinking more water and you're getting thirstier and thirstier, then we're going to add in something like a body armor or Redmond Relight, some kind of electrolyte beverage. Then after that becomes really kosher, we're good at that. Then we're going to work on reducing our overall caffeine load. And then we're going to work on breakfast. And then after that, we're going to work on things that are going to impact our sleep, like our wind down routine. And we'll have it stacked that way because if it's all or nothing thinking, it's exactly what you just said, Shay. It's that burnout. It's that burden of feeling like we had to change too much all at once. All right. So then what can that look like from the hydration and the fueling standpoint getting away from, you know, just eating maybe only one big meal a day or two meals a day. What can that look like as we're on the go? What are some options there? Yeah, I love it. So truthfully, for most farmers and ranchers, if I would to get if I were to give a time stance on how long I'd like you to go without eating, I would say no longer than five hours without eating something for most of us. Now, so many farmers and ranchers that I see, they wake up in the morning and they don't have hunger. And then what do they do on top of it? They're throwing back a pot of black coffee or they're taking, you know, a 20 ounce Yeti out of coffee. Reminder, you guys, coffee or caffeine in general is an appetite suppressant. So the first thing looks like avoiding caffeine until after we get something into our gut. So it could be something as simple as a smoothie. It could be a yogurt parfait, a banana and chocolate milk. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but because I work with people from all across the country, we work on feeling strategies that are realistic. How many nutritionists and vets and seed salesmen and milk haulers do I work with that have to eat lunch out a quick trip or out of a gas station or convenience store? So we're going to talk about things that are super simple, you know, hard boiled eggs, beef jerky, sun chips, Mott's brand fruit snacks are things that I love, cheese sticks, Nature Valley or Nutrigrain bars, fresh fruit. And when I say fresh fruit, I mean things like apples, bananas, oranges, one of those actual whole fruits that maybe doesn't have to be cold. Um, prepping some yogurt parfaits that have granola, or if you want to go one step further, throw some nuts and seeds in there, making your own trail mix, um, kefir chia seed pudding. And then obviously, you know, so many of us are behind machines all day. So single-handed meals or larger single-handed snacks. And what I mean by that is if breakfast is hard for us to sit down and have, you know, at the breakfast table or at the, at the dinner table each morning, we'll do something like a breakfast burrito or a burrito in general that's single-handed. You guys can eat it in the cab of a tractor or behind the wheel doing something, and you can still get your nourishment in without having to change anything regarding your actual schedule. Absolutely. And uh, I appreciate you sharing some of those tips. I know they it makes it a lot easier. And everything you mentioned on there are largely stuff that's available in a lot of rural grocery stores or people already have. I mean, I know that's been a big thing for me too, was, you know, what's available in my rural small town. And we have a great grocery store, but it's not the same as going to a Walmart at one of the bigger towns where there are more options. Folks, today is a new day in animal healthcare and MedGene is shining bright. MedGene has been a key innovator in the field of platform vaccine technology. MedGene enables veterinarians to put platform vaccines to work for the animals in their care. Swine, cattle, and companion animals 
all stand to benefit. It's time to talk to Medgene. It's a new day in animal health care. You can learn more about Medgene, the company, as well as what platform vaccine technology is by going to medgenelabs.com or even better yet, follow Medgene on LinkedIn. Okay, Kennedy. So the other point of, you know, maybe myth that I grew up hearing was you're not supposed to eat late at night, even though I grew up eating late at night to, mm-hmm. because we wanted to eat as a family, if at all possible. And in the summers, especially that meant dark, which was mm-hmm. pretty late. So it, what are, what strategies do you have for still fueling our body, being healthy, even if eating together as a family might mean later at mm-hmm. night? Yeah. I love this question. And exactly like you said, it's a myth. We're told by social media and people who have no nutrition knowledge, but have beautiful bodies that if you're eating after 5 PM, it's all getting stored. My strategy for fueling, especially for women is a high protein snack before they go to bed. So usually again, that can be as late as eight, nine o'clock protein is going to stimulate your metabolism for upwards of one to six hours, depending on what it is. So options that are closer to the one hour, those are going to be protein shakes, chocolate milk, milk in general, and then cuts of steak, thick cuts of meat in general. Those will be closer to the six hour range. So if you think about it, if we're having a real protein rich, good quality supper, and that's the one meal that we get to sit around the table for and eat as a family, your body does not slow down digestion just because it's 7.30, p.m. Again, my husband's a dairy farmer. So regardless of what time of year it is, the earliest we're eating supper is about eight o'clock. So what I know is as a woman, again, higher rates of protein before I go to bed, do better for me. They're going to recruit more of my metabolism. They're going to promote deeper sleep. They're going to do a whole host of really great things. So what I do is I just beef up the protein intake at supper time. Maybe I draw back my carbs just a little bit, nothing crazy, but draw them back a little bit. And then got plenty of vegetables and fruits on there and you're good to go. It doesn't have to be anything overcomplicated. And I think that's an issue we run into in social media too. You know, when I speak around the country, I get up on stage and the first thing I lead with is I'm going to break your guys' heart a little bit. I don't have a magic pill or a magic potion. I don't have anything that's probably much new information for you because we've been taught for so long that if it's not a magic pill or now an injection or something that is just crazy restrictive that scares us, it's not going to be it's not going to make a difference. So when I come in here with these fueling strategies that are realistic, whole foods based, and they're everything that you already know how to do. Sometimes it's like a breath of fresh air for people. So here is your blanket statement that it's okay. If you're eating supper at 8 PM, your body is not going to store that and turn it into fat. Okay. Kennedy. So we just finished up talking about late night suppers and with we're recording this and the time change is coming up. And I know a lot of people either are calving, they're entering calving, you are, and you know, and soon we'll be into haying, like things are just picking up fast as far as how busy we are. And with that, you also mentioned at the beginning of the episode, cutting back on caffeine. So let's talk Mm -hmm. about the sleep portion of the health equation, even though we were mostly talking about nutrition, but it's all related. So do you want to talk about kind of sleep hygiene or sleep habits Mm -hmm. and how they impact ranchers lifestyles? Mm -hmm. I love this. So sleep hygiene has been progressively something that I'm becoming more and more and more interested in for very valid reasons. So sleep is kind of one of the major pillars of success that I have for people that I work with and in farming, ranching, cowboying, all of those, you know, professions, it's kind of daunting when I say, you know, your sleep is your foundational foundation of success. And we know that during daylight savings time, when we lose one hour of sleep, we see heart attacks increase by 24% across the country. So what I do with men and women who work in agriculture and already have a high stress lifestyle is we start prioritizing cardiovascular health. So sure, cardiovascular health does look like exercise, but even bigger than that, it looks like increasing our consumption of fatty fish too. Now, this doesn't necessarily pertain to sleep. So bringing it back into sleep, we cut caffeine about one to 2 p.m. If you're somebody who's indulging in it, we don't want to have it after 1 to 2 p.m. because um, caffeine does have a half-life of about eight hours, meaning you'll feel the repercussions of caffeine for eight hours in your system. 
So if we're having it at 2 p.m. and we're going to bed at 10, we might notice that we're having a harder time or we're really struggling to fall asleep or we're waking up frequently throughout the middle of the night. Our mind is racing. Like I said, caffeine is also an appetite suppressant, but more than that, there's a pretty strong correlation with it being tied to anxiety um, as well. So if your head's hitting the pillow and you're writing a mental to-do list, but your caffeine was higher, reflect on that. And then we're going to start talking about kind of a wind down routine. So as I'm working with people, we start talking about sleep and having a wind down routine because when we sleep, our body's doing a whole host of things. Your body is resetting, it's regenerating, it's healing tissues, ligaments, it's letting go of past traumatic experiences that happened the day prior or setting them as memories. But in regards to nutrition, it's actually setting the tone for your hunger and fullness hormones. So we know that people who don't get efficient sleep each night, they have more dysregulation with those two hormones. They're more likely to feel super strong hunger. They're less likely to feel fullness. They're going to have more carby, more sugar rich cravings. And those cravings are going to feel almost insatiable. They're really out of our control. And we're almost always indulging in them. That's not a lack of willpower thing. It's tied directly to your sleep. So when I advocate for a wind down process, I want a three-step wind down. First step is a bedroom that's 61 to 71 degrees. Most people are in there. Second step is screen time. So we want off of all screens, TVs, laptops, cell phones, whatever they might be, technically two hours before you go to bed. And that's not realistic for us during many seasons of the year. So I adjust it and I say 30 to 60 minutes is usually enough for most of us to kind of... Um, work through some of the repercussions, I guess, of screen time. So we know screens, blue lights, they're disrupting the circadian rhythm. So our body's natural ability to fall asleep and wake up with the sun. But even bigger than that, blue light is actually turning down melatonin, our sleepy hormone production up to 50%. Going one step further, LED lights that all of us have in our calving barns and most of our buildings in our homes, that's actually suppressing melatonin up to 80%. So if you think of this melatonin, our sleepy hormone, if that's suppressed, we're going to struggle to fall asleep or relax and wind down at the end of the day. So focus something like that in there at least two hours before you're going to bed, turning lights off, dimming lights, turning lamps on, that should make a substantial difference. Third step is a completely dark room. We, we want blackout curtains. If you have a TV or a button that stays lit in your room, we want it covered with black electrical tape. If it can't be removed, it should be flipped over, turned off, covered up. So my perfect analogy here is let's say that you're falling asleep. It's two in the morning, your phone's lighting up. It might not be enough to wake you up, but if you roll over in the middle of the night and your eyes catch a glimpse of that light, we can shoot straight from deep sleep if that's where we are to REM cycle. And we're going to get an abundance of cortisol stress hormone that's produced in the middle of the night, but then we call them micro wakings. So we're more likely to feel like we weren't well rested when we wake up in the morning, the more often we're having those micro wakings throughout the night. So what we do is we give your body a real dark room and we hope, we hope we don't have any of those micro wakings. So nothing too crazy. It is a little bit of an investment in, as you know, in both your time and resources in your bedroom, but it's, it's worth it in the long run for sure. Well, and I think that goes back to not only like feeling better, but also the safety standpoint. I don't mm -hmm. remember what book it was, but I do remember reading a self-development book and it was talking about how driving sleep deprived was more dangerous, can be more dangerous than driving intoxicated. And I guess, mm -hmm. have you seen studies on that or? Yeah. So I actually, I can't, I know exactly what um, statistic you're talking about. So I do work with our local police force as well. And they related it to blowing like a 0.05 or something. I can't remember the exact um, alcohol toxicity point, but they related to, I think, losing two hours of sleep or being up for over 16 hours or 14 hours to basically driving drunk. Which is scary when you look at the big equipment mm -hmm. that farmers and ranchers can be. Right. Taking well, down busy roads too. Right. And bringing it back to caffeine too, which we, you know, make such a point to talk about when we have caffeine in our system. So many of us use it habitually, but then there are those ones of us who use it because we're falling asleep and we're tired and we feel like caffeine gives us that extra kick. We have this hormone called adenosine and adenosine is one of our sleepy hormones. And when we have caffeine, it puts this wall up against the adenosine, but our body is still producing it up against this wall. So it's not stopping production. We just built that wall and gradually over time, 
that caffeine wears off and that wall comes down and then we're flooded with all that adenosine. So what happens is we feel more tired once that caffeine wears off and we're more susceptible to going back to get a second helping of coffee later in the day or to needing the nap that we have progressively put off earlier that morning when we could have just had more sufficient you know, sleep or wind down processes in place. So there's some more fun facts for you about caffeine. All right. Well, Kennedy, anything else you want to share on the nutrition, sleep, or overall lifestyle tips? I think the biggest thing that I can think of will be tart cherry juice. If you guys have listened to anything I talk about, tart cherry juice, I am its biggest fan. So tart cherry juice is this really cool tool that we use to increase natural melatonin in your body. So tart cherry juice should not be had by those of us who are taking blood pressure medications, reason being because it's a vasodilator. So it does expand expand your blood vessels similar to your um, statins. But what happens is it's a vasodilator. It works on inflammation. And then after two weeks of consistency with tart cherry juice, just four ounces, 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed, we saw 85 minutes of deeper sleep. And if you're familiar with sleep, we really heal and repair and we feel rejuvenated when we're in that deep sleep. So 85 additional minutes of that each night would be fantastic for those of us who are waking up feeling like we're not well rested. All right. Well, you have, we have covered a lot of ground. And as we kind of wrap up, are there, what other like books, resources, Mm -hmm. any other recommendations that you want to share for people who are curious about how to improve their own lifestyles and start enjoying life more on the farm and ranch because they feel better. I love it. I love this question. So I read a lot of textbooks and by textbooks, I just mean books that increase my nutrition knowledge. And unfortunately there are none that are really related specifically to farmers and ranchers. But there are plenty of great resources, especially for women. We have now gotten a lot of resources that are actually geared at us. So if you're a woman who likes to exercise, if you're a female rancher or a female farmer, The Athlete's Gut, that's a really fantastic one. It's actually written by a PhD candidate from the University of Minnesota. It's very sciencey, but it talks about exercise impacting your gut. Roar, R-O-A-R, written by Stacey Sims. She's the researcher who actually found out or realized, did research to, to prove that a woman's anabolic window is not 60 minutes. It's actually only 30 to 40. And then if you're looking at increasing fertility or pregnancy nutrition, there's a dietitian named Lily Nichols. And she has two books called Real Food for Fertility and Real Food for Pregnancy. And those are fantastic, incredibly educational materials that truthfully, I think both men and women in agriculture could benefit off of because she's talking about real meat, real eggs, real dairy. Yes, she makes some controversial statements about um, forms of those, but nonetheless, the gist or the meat of the information is really incredible. So nothing that's specific to farmers and ranchers, but nonetheless, incredible resources. Otherwise, just following along, you know, on social media with true dietitians, not nutritionists will make a big, big difference. All right. And where can they find you? Because you are always sharing tips and snack ideas and all of that great stuff on your own pages. Yeah. So I have a website. It's called the legendary D A I R Y dietitian.com. Same thing on Facebook, same thing on Instagram. So you can find me at the dot legendary D A I R Y dot dietitian on Instagram and Facebook. All right. Well, Kennedy, thank you very much for joining me today and opening up and sharing all your knowledge with this group of ranchers, or I guess anyone who's listening. Heck yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, Shay. I'm excited. Hopefully it makes a big difference with your audience. Alrighty, folks. So like Kennedy said, you can head to her website or follow her on social media. Those links are in the show notes per usual, as well as with links to other resources, whether you want to join Rancher Minds, learn more about MedGene. They are the ones who brought this episode to you guys. Um, or land trust, there's quite a few different links that are down in the show notes. Go check them out. And if you ever have any questions, topic suggestions, whatever it may be, let me know, head to my website and uh, send me a message with that. Have a great day.